um, workshop uh, 94, creating, prote protecting, and providing access to digital culture. Is sound okay now? It's, it's okay, okay. Yeah, I, I was expecting we were going to uh, struggle a bit with the sound. Uh, my name is Andres Guadamux, not Guadamux, as uh, it's written here, and I'm a senior uh, lecturer in intellectual property law at the University of Sussex. I would like to thank uh, the organizers uh, uh, for inviting me. Uh, um, and we have a, a, a great panel. Uh, uh, Paolo and, and Stuart are, are, I think, uh, the organizers of, of, of all the event, and also they'll be speaking. Um, we'll conduct this in a very uh, nice and informal manner, uh, seeing that uh, we, we have a, a nice, cozy uh, room with, uh, with, uh, with a nice number of, uh, of uh, attendants. I, uh, I always start uh, panels and, and, and uh, presentations and everything with stories. And I'm, go I'm just going to have a very short to introduce uh, uh, the, the, the topic. Um, when I started teaching intellectual property, uh, the internet was still sort of fresh and new. And uh, my students started writing in their dissertations and essays uh, variations of the theme, the internet has changed everything. And every single dissertation started, the internet has changed everything, and it, it, it was all, I had to tell them at some point, I, if you write a variation of the internet has changed everything into an essay or a dissertation, I'm going to fail you. And they stopped doing that. But, uh, needless to say, it's actually true. Uh, the internet has changed quite a lot of, of, uh, of how we look at the dissemination of culture, dissemination of information. And uh, this panel is all about that. It's, a, it's about creating, protecting, providing access to digital culture and the means in which we have, uh, we're conducting this and we're creating culture, but also disseminating it and, and, uh, and having access to it has changed quite a lot. And these changes, the, the, the developments that we've encountered um, are uh, creating challenges for industry, for creators, uh, for uh, the memory institutions, for users in general, and policymakers, regulators, and, and, and bodies like the IGF. We have to come up with answers, and uh, part, uh, the, this panel is going to look at uh, challenges, but also maybe solutions, legislative solutions, policy solutions, market solutions, problems that uh, the users have encountered, and um, uh, uh, hopefully uh, that will create a, a very nice discussion on, uh, on some of the challenges that we are encountering. Uh, we have a, a fantastic panel, so uh, without the further ado, I'm going to start with Stuart Hamilton, who is Deputy Secretary General of the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA and uh, he's going to be talking uh, to us about, uh, I guess, uh, the, the library perspective. Thanks. Thank you, Andres, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, copyright's a great subject to be discussing at 20 to 5 uh, at the end of a long day, but I guess we'll give it a go. Um, although there are actually more issues than just copyright involved in a discussion of access to uh, digital cultural output, when we were coming up with the idea for this workshop, we were drawing uh, from IFLA's perspective on a report that we released last year called the IFLA Trend Report. And if you haven't come across this yet, I'd recommend that you go to trends.ifla.org, where you can find a document that we worked on for a year, uh, along with some internationally renowned experts, to tell us about the changes that were going to occur in society over the sort of next 10 years. Not the changes that were going to occur in libraries, but the changes that were going to occur in society so that librarians could work out how to deal with them. And one of the things that goes up front in this trend report is a little bit of an explanation of just how much digital information we have out there at the moment. So in 2010, the quantity of information transmitted globally exceeded one zettabyte for the first time, and that's now expected to double every two years. Hands up who can give me a definition of a zettabyte. 
I suspect not. I can't give you a definition of a zettabyte. I'll have to look it up. But um, internet traffic over the last decade has actually risen by 13,000%. There's been more digital information created between 2008 and 2011 than in all of the previous recorded history. And now to put it into some sort of context for those of you who like the NSA, uh, the National Security Agency's new center in Utah will be open uh, as of September just gone. It's capable of storing up to 12 exabytes of information. That's 12,000 petabytes. But to put that in perspective, only 400 uh, terabytes would be needed to store all the books ever written in any language. So with 1,000 terabytes in one petabyte, that's less than 1% of the NSA's new storage capacity. So if that hasn't completely blinded you with numbers, the fundamental point is that there's a lot of digital information out there. Now, as librarians, we kind of love content. We really love content. Without content, we wouldn't be able to stock our libraries. We wouldn't be able to put books on shelves. We wouldn't be able to have information resources in our databases. And of course, that means that we love creators as well, because creators are the people that actually help us um, make libraries what they are. Um, with all of this new digital, born digital information coming out, um, plus the work that libraries are doing to digitize old materials, you can see that, that many of our institutions are going to be really snowed under with a lot of work in the future. And because we've always really played society's traditional role in collecting and preserving and making available our cultural, scientific, and research content. But I guess the question for us now, and one of the reasons why we're sort of convening this panel, is whether or not libraries can keep up. Is it actually possible for us to continue to preserve, store, and make available all of this information? And I'm unfortunately tempted to sort of say it's, it's going to be very difficult for us. Um, I'm going to stop sort of saying, no, we can't. But I do think that because of this content explosion, we're in danger of having a massive black hole in the middle of our cultural record. And the reason for this, I think, is um, if we're, well, the reason for this is, is to do with copyright. I think if we're going to fix this black hole, we're going to have to fix copyright. And as anyone who's ever been involved in these discussions will tell you, that's a very difficult thing to do. Um, some of you will have been in the, the previous workshop looking at copyright, so I won't repeat too much of that. But basically, if you ever get involved in uh, copyright reform negotiations, you should expect to be in it for the long run, and you should expect to come out of it very bruised. Um, what you can do, it seems, in copyright at an international and national level is, is increase enforcement of copyright. This seems to actually be possible. Um, there's a very strong lobby that's, uh, that's, that's behind that, and it's understandable. There's a lot of money involved in content. But from libraries' perspective, we, we haven't been able to introduce more flexibility into the international copyright system. We need that flexibility because in some countries, we actually don't have the legal frameworks for preservation of information. Um, we don't quite know whether, when we preserve a born digital work, whether we're actually doing something legal or illegal. Um, and as I said in the previous workshop, what we love most after content is doing things right. Uh, we don't really feel comfortable going off grid and basically copying everything because that's not really how we roll. Now, we do have some capacity to do this in some countries around the world, uh, particularly in the European Union, uh, North America. Um, the countries that within the WIPO system are called the Group B countries, the developed industrial countries. They often have relatively flexible copyright exceptions, which will let you do a lot of this digital preservation work. However, with born digital content comes licenses and contracts. Uh, which really shifts things from the days when libraries were able to hand over um, $10,000 for a number of a really nice size collection. It's in print material, uh, first sale and exhaustion applies, and we're able to do with that material whatever we want. Now we're licensing material directly from publishers, and quite frankly, we're not buying that material. It is what it says. We are licensing it, and licenses come with terms and conditions. And we did a survey from the British Library um, almost 10 years ago, but we've updated it. I think 96% of the contracts that the British Library studied in their own um, environment, 96% overrode 
the available copyright exceptions and limitations. So on the one hand, we have a problem that we don't have adequate flexible copyright exceptions for this digital preservation. On the other hand, when we do have these good exceptions, often they're overridden by contract. And then there's a third element which I think is relevant to this discussion, which is that very few countries around the world have working electronic legal deposit legislation. For those of you who don't know, uh, legal deposit is when a country enacts a law so that at least one copy of everything published in print form can be dis deposited at a, at a designated national library and that goes into the cultural record. Now this is a problem for us uh, when it comes to preservation and I'm, I'm not going to go on at length here because we've got other speakers and we can pick this up in, the, in the, um, the questions but I guess the fundamental thing I wanted to say in my opening intervention is that we're feeling a little bit stuck. We're fully aware of all of this huge amount of information. We want to do something about it but a combination of outdated copyright frameworks, contracts and licenses and now much needed but unfortunately lacking electronic legal deposit leaves us wondering where our saviour is going to come from. And I can talk a little bit more later about how we might solve that problem. Yes. Uh, thanks, George. Uh, I'm going to eat uh, a little bit into the time because I have a pressing question precisely about uh, deposits that I think, because you didn't spend all of your time, I think I can ask you uh, immediately. I, I, am, I, I think the, the issue of uh, preservation of digital content uh, 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 and uh, legally mandated has been great for uh, for traditional books. I used to work in Edinburgh, next door practically to the uh, National Library of Scotland, which is the national copyright repository in Scotland, and it was fantastic. As a researcher, you could go and spend hours and hours and hours being a book geek, uh, uh, obviously, uh, 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 looking at the books, and you always knew that you could find work. And, and this is something that, that worries me greatly for researchers, but also for, for the, in the interest of, of, uh, of our culture, that, that we're potentially losing large amounts of, of uh, digital only information to uh, because we, we, we just haven't even thought about enacting some form of uh, 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 regulation or even some form of mandate that will allow uh, publishers to, to, to curate some of this wealth of digital content and you're saying that there is no easy solution but if I gave you the power tomorrow to change the world, uh, what would you, uh, uh, um, uh, how, how would you use it? Uh, how, would, how, how would you make digital curation and, and, and uh, repositories possible? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm, it's a bit sad that you put a caveat on the end of my powers there, because I was quite looking forward to being able to do a bit more than just digital preservation. But um, I think um, at the moment, we have what we're calling a patchwork of provisions around the world that let you do certain things. So, for example, the Library of Congress in the United States preserves tweets. Um, that, to me, seems like a Sisyphusian task or whatever you, you want to call it. I'm not entirely sure where they're going with that. But nevertheless, at times when there are great... Um, social upheavals, and I'm thinking about Arab Spring, I'm thinking about things where really people take to social media, it can be really instructive to be able to curate those pieces of born digital material. Um, whether or not that's actually legally possible outside of the United States, uh, I'm not entirely sure. So you'll have one country being able to do something like that. You'll have another country like the United Kingdom who's just passed um, a new sort of legal deposit act, which I have to say is extremely disappointing, which is a shame because they've, um, they've done quite well in terms of some other copyright reform recently. But the new electronic legal deposit act in the UK, I'm glad you said you liked going to the library to look at books because now in the age of the internet, we're going to have an electronic legal deposit act, which if you ever want to see what we're actually collecting, you better be prepared to get into your car and then bring your tablet to the library. So we have some interesting challenges in front of us whereby the people making policies about these things, it's not joined up, there's no mandate uh, that, that goes across countries, and we're not really seeing any awareness that actually library users won't want to necessarily drive all the way to a physical library when they know they can use the internet to access these resources. So we have a problem of expectations with our users. If I was going to use the powers that you've given me, 
I would make sure that what IFLA is trying to do at WIPO um, succeeds, and there we are trying to put an international copyright framework for libraries and archives together that's going to set um, some basic standards for copyright exceptions around the world. Now, that means not that everybody has harmonized exceptions, but that everybody would have to have a basic set of exceptions for libraries and archives. And that, that's quite important. We don't necessarily want everybody to have the same bit of language in every sort of country, but we want to be able to make sure that information can cross borders and that people are actually able to, to do this digital preservation in such a way that it's not just the US and, and the EU that's keeping track of their cultural heritage. Yeah, thanks. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I want to comment on the megalomania uh, the, that is implied in my question that those powers are mine to give. Uh, I, I hope uh, no one will mind that. Okay, uh, our next uh, presenter is uh, Paolo Lanteri. He is the uh, legal officer uh, uh, at the World in Intellectual Property Organization. And uh, yeah, Paolo, the room is here. Something wrong with the. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andres, and uh, thank you very much, Stuart, for setting the scene uh, in a very nice and, and, broad, and broad way. Um, I may start uh, by perhaps disappointing the audience by saying that uh, uh, WIPO, as organizer of this, uh, of this workshop, in fact, is here with more questions than answers. We don't have uh, uh, answers yet. Uh, there are several processes ongoing, and we are hosting some of those processes. So if uh, we had an answer, uh, we would probably not need to, to have this kind of forum for, for discussion with uh, so many stakeholders. The reason for organizing this workshop for the World Intellectual Property Organization is in fact to get uh, a better idea from uh, practitioners in the field, from libraries, from users, and from, of course, right uh, holders, on what are the real concrete challenges in the day-to-day -day life, in the distribution, well, creation, uh, distribution, access, and preservation of born digital uh, content. We have heard, and uh, uh, being a lawyer surrounded by librarians, I'm not here to quote uh, any data. We already uh, heard some astonishing uh, data on the impact, on the scope of the problem we are talking about, and numbers told by themselves. Digital is the rule rather than the exception. Uh, there are many challenges ahead that have not been addressed, and uh, still, copyright legislation is mostly has been devised for an analog environment. This is a sort of fact. One starting point I would like to stress is that really the acknowledgement of the importance of the issue is a well-achieved result. Uh, we are discussing this here, but uh, in 2014 is the 10th anniversary, the 10th birthday of uh, limitation and exceptions issue in the agenda of the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights. Nothing more and nothing less than the broadest, the largest uh, norm setting forum where, m with m where more than 187 member states uh, and uh, um, more than 300 NGOs are contributing to a debate focused to a possible normative solution, uh, focused on limitation exceptions to copyright. Of course, um, the, the process is lengthy, but let me, uh, let me give you some obvious remark on that. Technology moves faster than law, and uh, there are some good reasons for that. And particularly when we talk about uh, born digital material, uh, not all the problems are copyright specific problems. We also have, and to have, we need to budget in economic and technological problems consideration when we need when we want to look at concrete solution so copyright is part of the puzzle and um, there is uh, there has been ongoing discussion and i think there is also a broad agreement on the need for limitation and exception for libraries and, and archives what where the agreement is missing among the international community is uh, 
on how to achieve these limitation and exceptions for libraries and archives. So without any purpose of giving any copyright lecture, I think it's good always to remind ourselves where we stand on this point and remind ourselves lawyers um, how, how the system works. In fact, treaties recognize rights and at the same time they provide for principle uh, that allows um, countries to provide limitation and exceptions to those rights. The three-step test principle. I think we can enter into that if someone is interested in the details, but what is the result of this? The result of this is the current copyright framework. Fragmented, territorial, where member states have freedom to decide what are the, the, the limitations to copyright. So it may well be that in one country, uh, a library is, is allowed to make uh, uh, a reproduction for preservation purposes, maybe multiple reproduction and format shifting and so on, and others, no, there is nothing in the law. But there is no argument about the need for allowing uh, libraries to perform their function. And here we're talking about, uh, this is the system, how it works. The crucial point of the debate, at least I, as I see it, is, is not only about uh, libraries and archives, it's about uh, uh, breaking, the, changing the system, re I mean, reinverting the system. That is not only saying, you member states, you Italy, you England, you need to recognize the right of production, communication with the public and so on, but you must also make sure that your libraries are allowed to make reproduction, multiple reproduction, format shifting for per, uh, preservation. So it's, uh, it's, it's, I think it's, it's an argument to partially justify the lengthiness of the process at least. Uh, in this system, I cannot omit to mention that there is a, a, a remarkable uh, exception to this system. It is a quite recent exception, uh, is the Marrakesh Visual Impaired Treaty that was signed uh, a little bit more than one year ago, that, current, that actually established an obligation for future member, uh, state, uh, member party to that treaty to uh, have in that legislation provisions that will allow access and exchange, cross-border exchange, uh, enabling access for the visual impaired to printed content without enter into detail of that, this is a remarkable exception that we can also argue is not really speeding up the debate on the other issues because it's the first, uh, first important thing. So we are in the, at, the, at, at the edge of a potentially huge change in, in, the balance, uh, in the balance of the system. Nevertheless, the international community have invested huge resources, 10 years of work of people like, uh, like you, Stuart, and many others in this room, like me that works in the Secretariat and member states, uh, going to that meeting, uh, that will, uh, meeting room in Rome in Geneva and uh, making the case for this, uh, for this need. What has produ produced all these, these efforts, 10 years of work? Basically, in concrete terms, two things. One is, uh, is a document, which I rather call with the code than the, the full title, because it would take uh, for 15 minutes to pronounce it. Is a document, this is just slash 26 slash 3, that is a working document on a possible instrument for limitation and exception for the benefit of libraries and archives. That's, uh, it's, it's not the exact quotation, but I can, I can provide it with that if you wish. And uh, it, it includes several topics. Many uh, of them uh, have already been mentioned by Stuart, like uh, preservation purposes. In, uh, interest also, very importantly, there are, there are some, uh, some um, part of the document that discuss the relation between uh, limitation and exceptions and, and contracts, uh, cross-border effects uh, and cross-border uses uh, of, those, uh, of, the, of, those, uh, of those content. Um, they, uh, member states, also made sure we produce some information material, like several studies, very informative studies, nine studies on, on, uh, on limitation and exceptions, uh, looking at how countries have actually implemented those treaties. In particular, one uh, that was published in 2008, the Kenneth Cruz study on uh, limitation and exception for libraries and archives, have been, uh, by mandate of member states, requested to, to undertake a, a, an update. And uh, for the interest of anyone, the plans are to 
um, released the update of this study uh, in, at, at the incoming SCCR uh, in December of this year. So let's wait for uh, the numbers, let's wait for the figures, uh, but already many, the feeling, the general feeling is that from 2008 many things have changed, possibly not enough, and uh, if in 2008 uh, we had uh, a little bit more than 120 uh, countries uh, covered by the study that included limitation on section that were applicable to libraries and archives, we, are, uh, we hope to, f to have more in 2014, but still, if you look, look at objectively at the limitation exception system, um, they are mostly devised and, and created for the analog environment. And we, we told at the beginning that digital is the rule and not the exception. And this, is, this is a fact, I think we can, we can all agree on that. So this is where we stand uh, in terms of uh, norm setting processes. Uh, a brief mention to what are the other means that are in, in the tools that are in the hands of uh, a United Nations like uh, agency like WIPO to help a member state to develop their, their uh, copyright system in, in a balanced way. We provide legislative assistance to member states which is based on, on uh, an, a demand process uh, I mean, is on demand and is, very, is tailor made and focused on specific requests of a member state. Uh, this activity is extremely important and the WIPO uh, provides the service really uh, on a, with a neutral bilateral way and, uh, and it doesn't have any mandate to follow up on potential new copyright reforms. So we can do as only what member states ask us to do. <coughs> then there is another line of, of work that is, I think in this field is crucial, which is copyright infrastructure, which is technology, data. Whenever we can, WIPO support technologically these countries. We already have some services in the field of copyright, WIPO calls for collective management, GDA, which is the question of the for regist uh, copyright registration, and uh, there is a uh, in, in starting initiative called uh, Global Data Management that will scope all, all, uh, all mm, content, uh, all market content, uh, uh, and, and look at possible common solution uh, in terms of uh, technological management of rights and also limitation exceptions. And then finally, we also organize things like this, which we believe are still very important, by, like the race awareness, capacity building, and, and many other things in cooperation with many other uh, stakeholders. So this, uh, uh, with that, I would conclude my intervention going back to the initial remark uh, that the reason why we are here is that we are really looking for new ideas and inputs on what, on what uh, we could uh, uh, improve uh, in our mission and how the international community uh, could actually better engage uh, in this challenge of uh, having a, an, an IP system that is really suited uh, for the new, the new challenges. Thanks a lot. So I'm looking for the contribution from all the participants and the speakers. Uh, thanks, Paolo. Uh, I have a couple of questions, but uh, we'll, they will be uh, eating into uh, the other speakers' uh, time, so I w we'll save them uh, for later, if, if possible. But I have, uh, continuing the megalomania uh, uh, theme, uh, I have a couple of ideas of creating a, uh, an island with a big global repository, so uh, uh, let's... Uh, let's think about that. Okay, uh, so next uh, is uh, Cristiana Gonzalez, uh, who is um, from the committee, uh, Comité Gestor da Internet no Brasil. I'm, I'm, I'm my Brazil, Brazil, Brazilian pronunciation is very bad. Um, yeah. Well, I'm, I would say oh. that I'm representing actually University of Sao Paulo. Because oh, okay. I'm, You're, okay. Uh, <laughs> and I was going to say also University of Sao Paulo, <laughs> but uh, uh, Brazil is, is such a, a uh, a, a leader in, in some of these topics, and uh, she's going to give us some of the perspectives uh, uh, from develop, uh, develop com developing country perspective. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, indeed, we have been a leader at the WIPO development agenda, but I give a, a shift on the discussion and because if people get tired of going to Geneva and to be part of WIPO negotiations, they can just change the agenda to the file sharing legalization agenda, which is one of the topics that we are going to try next year in Brazil. 
and reforming the, the copyright law. So I would like to, to, to present this idea of file sharing. Uh, that's, uh, that's not a new idea. We have uh, lots of countries that have already tried that. We have like Sweden, Norway, uh, we have Canada, we have uh, Portugal. Lots of countries try to approve laws related to that. So, and this idea is, la is very uh, connected to the, to the copyright fights that oppose creators and users, consumers on the one side, and uh, publishers, intermediaries, and, and copyright um, holders. So, those copyright fights and most of the copyright laws are based on or not very reli reliable data. That's what we discovered in, not discovered, but what, that's what we are researching in Brazil. So those, um, those industry reports, uh, they, their methodology is n never is clear. And when it's clear or open or available for researchers or for the public, uh, they are extremely biased. So. Some uh, university study shows that there are, not economic, no, there are no economic advantages uh, for developing countries, especially when you think about law enforcement uh, against pirates, or what I prefer to say, the share of unauthorized copies. Uh, for example, when you look at pirates at countries in, like Brazil, like Mexico, Bolivia, and India, the findings are that the main cause of piracy is a comp combination of high prices uh, of, for cultural goods, uh, low incomes, and increasingly cheap, uh, cheap uh, digital technologies. So when the industry talks about the culture of not respecting intellectual property, uh, they do not consider the real issues like uh, the prices, incomes, and the cheap technology, technology that, um, that are the main causes of this phenomenon. So the second thing that must be noticed is that after seeing a lot of initiatives of enforcement through the years, uh, we do not find any data that, that demonstrates uh, the effect on the general availability of pirated goods. So there is no positive effect on the, the industry growth when we have strong enforcement laws or public policies. So there is also a series of studies that shows that uh, on the other side, uh, the, the for example, there is a Harvard study that shows that downloaded music does not affect record sales. Uh, there is an European Union research project called Music Lessons, uh, which shows music sales are not affected positively by file sharing. Uh, there is more recent research from 2013 from London School of Economics showing that the copyright industry appears to be doing well. Uh, that pirate copying doesn't appear to harm the industry and that they struggle against pirates may harm innovation entrepreneurship. Uh, there is also a book called Media Pirates in Developing Economies by, this was written by Sean Flynn and Joe Karaganis at the Columbia University uh, that argues that it's socially normative to pirate copy, that the stopping pirates insist to have failed. So there is no reason to, to keep going with the enforce, law enforcement and and the piracy, all this piracy fight against, especially against developing countries. Uh, there is also, and I'm not talking only about developing countries, when you look at the developed world, like especially uh, US and Germany, there is also some data that shows that uh, copied, uh, shared, or download for free music and TV shows, that you have like half of the population doing that. And, and we, which is a phenomenon that some call the copy culture. Uh, so among the solutions that uh, we have been discussing for years, you have like this, the whole agenda on exceptional limitations that's very important for us, especially in the devel developing world. Uh, we also have the licensing options like the Creative Commons and, and another on other kinds of licenses, but they are not the solution of the problem. Just they're they're just uh, in the middle of of the way to finally stop this fight. 
And then we came up with this idea of, of the legalizing file sharing in Brazil because we are also facing this. And the main idea is that, uh, and this could sound like a freaking idea when, when thinking about, uh, because, um, but it's, it's a remarkable initiative in terms of access to knowledge. Uh, the, the, um, Although we have uh, lots of political pressure for not having it, and um, even among activists, there is not uh, still a consensus, but uh, we, we need to put that in public and discuss that. Um, so the main idea of file sharing legalization is that the non-commercial file sharing will be authorized, and each broadband user will pay for a modest fee. Like in Brazil, we, we got a number of uh, um, uh, almost $2. Uh, and this fix comes together with, with the monthly internet service provider bill. So the ISP will collect the fees and distribute it to the collecting society comprised of authors, associations that will then distribute it to the collected fees in the proportion of the works that have been downloaded. So who is going to pay? Uh, our broadband home users is going to pay this fee. And also, so some must be asking, if, is this fee sufficient? Uh, if you think, um, uh, if you think about, if, if you compare with the, 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 the today revenue of, of the industry, uh, this would represent approximately 115 million per year for, for the industry. And for sake of comparison, um, this represents approximately 55% of the four largest record companies' revenues. So it's a lot more that they are, they are having now. So, and who will receive uh, this fee? not on the industry, the creators through their collecting societies. So at least 60% of the amount collected will be distributed to a physical person, musicians, composers, writers, and so on. So authors will also gain much, much more than they are having now. And what will be authorized? Only non-commercial file sharing through different technologies, including music, films, and books, affecting every kind of use that we are trying to to have now, like for educational proposals, for libraries, for, for visually impaired. And what about uh, the traditional means of commercial and cultural goods? So they're not going to be affected because all these studies that we have now are proven that uh, the file sharing is not affecting uh, their revenues. So that is the main that I'm going to put in the table for discussion further. Thank you, that was uh, fascinating. I've, I've, I've been quite, quite interested in some of these examples of legalizing uh, file sharing or, or creating a legalized system, or, uh, some form of revenue system as well. Uh, uh, um, I've been fascinated as well by the things like arg.org, which is actually piracy, but I shouldn't mention that. Uh, there is academic uh, file sharing in a way, people sharing their own research, uh, putting it uh, anonymously so that other researchers can act, have access to that. So uh, we, we, uh, I'm already uh, eating up into a, too much time, so I'll, I'll, I'll jump uh, right away. We'll keep this uh, for the discussion. Uh, um, Next is uh, Makane Faye. Uh, he's uh, the uh, chief uh, of the knowledge management section and library services of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. But, uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. Uh, thank you, uh, Ifla Stuart, for uh, giving us this opportunity to be a panelist here. Uh, on this important issue of uh, access to information and knowledge and the uh, problems which hinder this uh, uh, process. Uh, I would like to say that uh, scientists, researchers, and all other users in African countries face problems in accessing the world's research published information. The cost of acquiring 
current publications, paper and digital form, from shelves, databases, and repositories is very high. This results in relying on exchange programs of libraries, archives, and documentation centers to have access to current knowledge. To mitigate these problems, some of the libraries facilitate electronic access to digitized collections, both in the Africa region and elsewhere. They also benefit from interlibrary loans. However, with the copyright issues, access to photocopying, sharing, reproduction, and distribution of certain types of documents is prohibited. Not only this creates access problem, but also issues related to restoration and preservation of documents, which cannot be done with the current copyright regime, and leads to a lot of documents being destroyed and a lot of information being lost. This unfortunate state of affairs is created by the absence of appropriate legislation and laws adapted to the technological evolution and the wide use of the internet. In fact, the copyright law has been struggling to adapt to the dynamic impact of internet and digital technologies. We know that uh, the copyright regime was put in place to promote creation by ensuring fair rewards to the creators. Now it has almost become a barrier to the knowledge economy and an impediment to promote access to knowledge and, of course, innovation. Accordingly, at ECA, we believe that there is a need to review the evolution of the copyright policies because what we see today is that creators are enjoying bigger protection while the users are being penalized. When we are working in the framework of the World Summit on the Information Society, which advocates for information and knowledge society for all. And uh, I believe that two months ago, at the WSI Plus 10 review, the outcome document indicated in Article 16 that we need to ensure the preservation of digital heritage in the information society by putting into place cohesive, conceptual, and practical digital strategies supported to the extent practicable at international level for the preservation of and access to recorded information in the digital environment in all its forms while respecting individual privacy. However, the multitude and diversity of stakeholders invested in the copyright law and policy with their own perspective, with their own interest and diverging interest, which uh, in fact uh, profit to the creators, it is very difficult for our community of knowledge workers to advance our agenda. To conclude, I propose that we work towards identifying a redefined purpose of copyright to take into account the knowledge economy into a fully web-integrated copyright framework. I believe that this can be done uh, by uh, adopting, endorsing, promoting the uh, draft which was prepared by IFLA, the treaty proposal on limitations and exceptions for libraries and archives published in December 2013, so that this can be owned by member states and put forward to the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights at WIPO. I conclude by quoting former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan who indicated that with information on our side, with knowledge a potential for all, the path to poverty can be reversed. Thank you. Uh, thanks, that was excellent. It's a uh, good call to arms, uh, uh, 
in, 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 this, uh, in this subject, I think uh, that uh, what we need is legislative solution mostly or treaty solution, I think. That's, that's, that's an excellent point. Um, so uh, last but not uh, least uh, is Arlette uh, Becking. Uh, did I pronounce that correctly? Baking. Baking, sorry. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah. my Dutch colleagues do it wrong all the time, <laughs> yeah. so it's okay. Uh, um, one of the advantages of, uh, of, of chairing a session is that I get to do to other people what they do to me all the time, the mispronouncing my name. Yes. Uh, but yeah, so, sorry. But uh, uh, she comes uh, representing IEF, but also a Pictorite, which is a, uh, it's an author's right organization for virtual creators in the Netherlands. So, so it looks That's true. quite fascinating. Yes. Thanks. Thank you for the short introduction. I'm very happy to be here today. And um, my name is Arlette Beking. I work as a project manager for, uh, for Pictorite and also as a legal counsel. Um, uh, Pictorite is a collective management uh, organization in the Netherlands. We represent visual artists, photographers, uh, designers, illustrators, cartoonists, and also um, architects. I'm also on behalf of the International Authors Forum today. Um, uh, this is a forum uh, for authors organizations, and um, they collaborate with other organizations rep representing authors worldwide. Um, today, I would like to uh, talk briefly with you about mass uh, digitization by cultural archives in the Netherlands. Um, in the recent past, a lot of subsidies have been given to the, uh, by the Dutch Ministry of Culture to uh, cultural archives. This comes forth from the digital agenda of Europe in order to digitize, uh, amongst others, books, newspapers, magazines, and images. The cultural archives all started to digitize uh, in order to put their collections uh, online, well, in the Netherlands then. These collections had always been inside the archives, and the archives didn't have so much to do with copyright until, until then. Sorry, I'm not uh, very fast with the, <laughs> with the clicking. Um, well, this led to a, a problem for them uh, because the current system of copyright in the Netherlands is that um, permission is needed from every right holder. And when you look at uh, an archive which we have in the Netherlands, um, the Dutch Royal Library, it has digitized three million pages. And when you um, think about that every page has, well, five uh, articles and uh, images, it means that uh, 15 million works have to be um, well, uh, to get permission from uh, from the maker and, or uh, uh, the uh, the legal entity behind it, so that uh, well that led to an uh, enormous uh, uh, obstacle for them. So um, in 2009, we started talking with them, um, and uh, we have come with a solution. I'm sorry. Um, we have uh, we we took a look at um, the extended collective licensing system in Scandinavia, and uh, we thought about well maybe uh, it is possible to uh, uh, come up with a solution uh, so that the archive can put the whole uh, collection online uh, at once. And uh, the way we do it, uh, we have uh, uh, agreed on several contracts now, is uh, by granting a collective license and also uh, by giving an uh, indemnification with a maximum. And uh, in this way, the, the archive uh, uh, can show all of the articles and images online. Um, we do want a, a right holder uh, to have the possibility to opt out if uh, he doesn't or uh, her doesn't agree with it. But um, by uh, making the collective contracts uh, work, we also can grant uh, a remuneration for the visual artists um, 
uh, all the visual artists which are in the archive. So not only the artists which are uh, at Pictorite, but we, uh, everybody can uh, get a remuneration. Um, an example, well, I already mentioned it, is the, is the Royal Library. Um, well, it, it, it works, uh, the, the, the contract, but there are a, a few uh, visual artists who opted out, uh, and uh, well, photographers, and um, well, that leaves with, a, and that, so another problem arises is um, the images of those visual artists are now on black, so you cannot see it, so the cultural archive is not uh, complete anymore. So it might, might not be the best uh, uh, way, but um, well, with this contract, the Royal Library is, uh, it is possible to, uh, to show the archive. Another archive we have uh, uh, made an uh, agreement with is the National Archive. Um, there are 350,000 images inside this archive. Um, they cannot uh, make reproductions uh, when they want uh, to make a reproduction for, for other users. Uh, and then I mean physical reproductions or uh, giving licenses. That's, that's not possible, but uh, when that situa situation is, uh, when somebody wants a, a reproduction, they have to go back to the, to the right holder. But, um, well, I think it's a, it's a good, good way uh, to uh, put it all online. Well, I already uh, mentioned some uh, individual uh, right holders who don't want their uh, works in, in, in an archive. But the, uh, another obstacle is uh, also that there is no legal framework to um, make these contracts. We, we, we're just trying to uh, 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 develop an, a solution, but, um, well, we don't know what will happen when it comes uh, before the, for the judge. <laughs> also, we have... Um, um, experienced a lot of unwillingness uh, at uh, Dutch uh, archives, not, not all of them, but um, well, most of them, they, they don't want to pay a remuneration. That's uh, a big problem, and uh, I, I can understand that from their perspective, because uh, uh, of course uh, you uh, rather uh, put the money into new digitization projects. I understand that, but um, the archive is filled with, with works of right holders, so, well, you ha have to do something. I don't think you can get it all for free. Um, and um, so, with the unwilling archives, we have uh, uh, started two lawsuits, and uh, it, it looks positive, um, but, well, it's also uh, not the, the, the way we would want it, it to go. So, um, well, we'll see how, how it develops. Um, a solution, I think, well, I already uh, uh, mentioned it, is might be extended collective licensing. Um, uh, the, the Dutch uh, Ministry of Culture already commissioned the research on, uh, on this topic because the Orphan Works uh, uh, Directive uh, has to be implemented uh, really soon. So um, we're hoping on a, on a good uh, uh, new legal framework, but uh, until that we, have to we, we will continue with, uh, with this. Um, and I have a, a question for the public or the audience, whether it is nonsense to charge cultural archives or, uh, or it's okay. <laughs> but I don't think uh, <laughs> you will say yes. <laughs> well, yes, yes. Uh, that's, uh, uh, thanks, uh, that's fascinating. Uh, I I have so, too many questions of, to everyone. Uh, I think we sh just have quick one minute to ask you a very quick question arising from what you just said. What was the basis of the two uh, cases? 
the basis. Uh, yeah, what, um, was there well, we, uh, direct uh, infringement? We did a collect collective yeah. action mm -hmm. uh, uh, for all the visual artists who are uh, at mm -hmm. Picturite, but we also mm -hmm. um, uh, made a... a we named a, a, a couple of visual artists like mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dali and uh, mm -hmm. well uh, other, and photographers. We uh, claimed uh, uh, rights for them specifically. So mm -hmm. and and there's uh, and we also claimed uh, amounts of money for them uh, in advance to the uh, well the, the archive has to do uh, how do you say that. Um, when we are, uh, uh, when we will win, the archive has to say which works they uh, they all used, and then they have okay. to. But um, yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's that was the basis. Yes, yeah. uh, it was quite quite interesting. But uh, the collective uh, action uh, uh, mm -hmm. will probably be. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, okay. Yes. I'll, I'll have to look into that. Um, that sounds fascinating. Yes. So uh, that leaves us very nice, exactly half an hour for questions and discussions, which is just as I planned it. You know, I, I, I megalomania again. Uh, time falls into place. <laughs> type of thing. So yeah, uh, we've heard some quite interesting uh, things. Uh, first, uh, we'll uh, hand it to the audience uh, that is here to see if you have questions or comments uh, to the presenters and then uh, for potential for online uh, participation. So I see one hand already here. Okay. If uh, anyone who asks a question, please tell us uh, who you are, uh, with, uh, where you're from. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Susan Anthony, United States Patent and Trademark Office, Alexandria, Virginia, United States. My question is simple. Where do museums fit in all of this? Well, thanks a lot. I think it's an extremely appropriate question. I didn't want to put it in, in my opening remarks because uh, it was uh, already a lot of meat and material. But uh, first of all, uh, from the, um, in ge generally speaking, in several national legislations, uh, limitation exceptions for libraries and archives could potentially apply and apply in many instances to, for museums. And, uh, and this also uh, emerges from, from, uh, from the Kenneth Cruz study in 2008. Specifically to the future, towards the future, I think uh, we had uh, a major change uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in our discussion uh, within, in, in WIPO because uh, uh, for the first time uh, or for the first time in this fashion, the International Council or Museum came to our committee and made the case for their need for limitation exceptions. So basically, suddenly everyone started to look at the document and, and we actually realized that the document was already including, the draft treaty provision were already including several instances, the mention of museums on the side of library, archives and museums. Of course, we all understand there are differences. We all understand there are differences, but in terms of uh, uh, preservations uh, of digital assets, for instance, pictures or in uh, like access to the repertoire and so on, I think there are mm, good arguments to, to, to consider them as possible beneficiaries of uh, these limitation and exceptions. So towards the future, we also, uh, we, we are asked to produce a specific sur global survey following the same structure of the libraries and archives for museums that will be available next year. And uh, the scope of that, uh, of, that, um, of that study will be WIPO member states. So we are looking forward to that, to, to see really also from, besides the uh, 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 really, I would say, like uh, first, first sight uh, observation, like some academic research or some elaboration of uh, what this uh, uh, scope research uh, results will be. So I'm sure you were the, uh, maybe. Uh, yeah, I'll say view. a couple of words. I mean, Paolo said, yes, that there's, there's likely to be some potential uh, uses of a, of a library and archives treaty for the museum's community. Um, 
IFLA has a sort of strategic partnership and relationship with, with the big kind of IFLA equivalents in the museums, the archives, the monuments and sites. So um, ICOM, I think, are the organisation that, uh, that, that comes to WIPO. Or rather, they've, they've come to WIPO sort of like once or twice. Um, so they actually haven't really been involved in this process, but they seem to be quite keen to be involved now. Um, and that's fine, because there's, there's elements of this which really could be picked up. But we would, we would be concerned if um, the work that we've been pushing forward for five or six years was uh, delayed, slowed. We've already noted how snail's pace this is. So we would, we would be concerned if we, if we took a detour off and started expanding this and expanding this, notwithstanding the fact that there are elements of this treaty that could be... Um, your treaty proposal that could be useful. And the museums themselves need to get their house in order with what they want to see happen in it, because asked directly, they, they don't yet know. So that's, uh, that's, that's obviously a bit of a stumbling block when you ask them directly, what do you want to see in this? What do you think will happen? They haven't formulated a response to that yet. But that's not to say that there isn't an element in this which could be of benefit to them. But then we're going into a nice discussion of some sort of WIPO-type politics here, just off on the left-hand side, I think. Cristiano was also going to... Oh, he's a direct follow-up then, yeah. Thanks. I, I guess where I'm having some hesitation is because I, uh, I do a lot of work with American Indian cultures in the United States, and I am thinking of many artifacts, but also many texts that could find themselves properly housed in a museum or an archive or a library. And at the end of the day, I would think we would all have a shared concern that similar materials are treated similarly, or, or maybe not. I, I don't know, but that's the reason for my question this morning or this afternoon. Before I tell Christiana to, to, to also answer, are you concerned about possible misappropriation of, of these artifacts so, uh, uh, if, if they get housed in, in, in digital formats? Or uh, is, is that your concern? Or, or, or I'm, not, I'm not sure. Uh, are you concerned yeah. that they won't be preserved? Is, or is your concern? Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I misunderstood. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, the Brazilian delegation and us with Brazil, we talked a little bit with ICON and some representatives of museums in Brazil. And then we raised some common points that you already have in the library's proposed that could fit the museum's purpose, like uh, preservations, copies for preservations, uh, orphan works, uh, DRM, um, Contracts is another issue that would be the same for the museums and libraries. Uh, the protections of uh, intermediaries, like uh, people that work for museums, they're not the responsibility for intermediaries. And the, the, the translation, right. So we, we came up with these common points. And, but, but as George said, the, the, the museums, they're not being very proactive in this. And, and I think that the, the, what would be more productive is like make them join the libraries in this discussion and in order to not have like more 20 years of discussions in, to get a treaty. Yes, uh, Arlette or no? You don't have any comments on that or on the museums? Well, with the museums, it's, um, I, th I think it's more easy to see who the right holders are or to have a direct, re they ha all have a direct relation to the, the, to the artist. Um, but with the preservation, I think uh, that's uh, perfectly fine, of course. Um, and we already have it in the in the Dutch law; uh, it's already uh, in there. So, um, but with picture rights, uh, we are uh, having a, a, 
we already have a good contract with, uh, with the museum. We also have a, a cooperation uh, uh, where all the museums fall under. And they have a, a, a broad way of uh, using, they can use it, the material on a broad way, even on a social network and, yes? Also, uh, well, always with the name of the artist uh, in there, of course. Makane, <laughs> uh, uh, I think nothing to add. Uh, okay, um, I have another follow-up on, on uh, museums, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave that in case uh, uh, we have time. Yeah. Um, uh, my name is Riyad Belushi. I'm a PhD student from Oman. I have a question for Ms. Gonzalez. Um, you mentioned that um, in this uh, legal file sharing system that the money collected from the ISPs would be distributed depending on how many works would be like shared. Um, how do you see the interface between that and privacy of the users? How would that be addressed? Uh, that, that's one of the, the problems of these proposals. That's why so many activists are against it. But uh, there is some software uh, developed to, 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 to protect it, your privacy while they, you are measuring that. So it would be a software that could protect you. Oh, okay, yeah. I have a, a follow up. Oh, I'm sorry, Rick Lane, 21st Century Fox. Um, the first person spoke about how many terabytes of information are transferred now across the net? A lot. So getting back to that other question that the gentleman just asked, and you're talking about you know one country in Brazil, you have peer-to-peer, -peer, you legalize peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Who's going to keep track when that when other countries are tapping into that? Who's paying them? You have the the cost of the collection societies. You mentioned uh, how much was the amount of money that you would collect on two dollars? Uh, how much two dollars? How much? Two dollars? Like, no, no, but what was the total amount of revenue? A uh, hundred fifteen million dollars. So the average price of our movies to make is one hundred and twenty million. We spend two billion dollars a year just on television show production. Another three and a half billion on movie production. Um, a hundred, you wouldn't even pay for one movie at one studio, the cost of the potential piracy of around the world, because if you legalize peer-to-peer -peer in one country, what stops everybody from tapping into that .bz um, website and illegally sharing it all over the world, and we're only getting $115 million from Brazil. You're going to get $150 million for, every, for the whole globe because if Brazil does that, the other countries must do that because otherwise it's going to... But that's not necessarily why you're the case. Be a leader. I mean, countries don't protect intellectual property now, and why would they incentivize and charge their own people when they can get it for free? Oh, it's not for free. No, no, Authors they, are going... No, but if you legalize it just in Brazil, it will start off, you know, first five years, because laws take a while to pass, and you legalize peer-to-peer -peer sharing in Brazil, you'll have people from around the world not paying into the system. And when their governments try to go back and say, oh, we are now going to charge you $2, they're gonna, they're gonna fight back and say, no way, why are we gonna pay? I mean, they're not paying the $1.99 for music now. You know, why would they pay? And plus, trying to keep track of every copyrighted work going across the net with two gazillion trillbytes of information and keeping track all over. I mean, you basically create a state of privacy concerns that would be second to none and make you know, the NSA look pretty uh, tame by comparison. I had a, a question and or a follow-up, I think, to that uh, right here. Yeah, just a remark. Um, I think you're uh, having the underlying assumption that if uh, file sharing is legal, nobody pays for content anymore. But of course, uh, filmmakers make revenue from, from cinema sales, from people paying for streaming services, from merchandise, and ev all of that goes into the financing of uh, movies. So I would say, um, 
that it is already legal in uh, certain legal uh, areas to download films or to watch streams. So uh, this has not led uh, to nobody paying for content anymore. But, but you imagine a, a Netflix would not exist today if you had peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Um, in, in a legal peer-to-peer -peer file sharing in the US, if Napster case had gone the other way or Grokster, you would not have Netflix today. What is the economic incentive for them to pay us for our content if their competitor would be a free service that's not having to pay for anything? And it's the same content. Well, um, incidentally, I, uh, we don't have Netflix in Germany, unfortunately, but uh, I pay for Spotify, for example, even though I could download the same music for free, but I use Spotify as a matter of convenience because actually being offered um, a, a service is something that people are very willing to pay for. So it's not necessarily the case that if there is a, a legal way of uh, downloading something for free, that this is necessarily the With most Spotify's convenient way. The, the rights holders. So they're they're being put at a either at they they would be put at a competitive disadvantage of a site that's not doing the same thing. So if you legalized it, there would be no Spotify because what would be who would invest in a Spotify if you can just invest in a streaming service that doesn't have to pay any licensing fees? This is fascinating discussion, but we're turning it into a peer-to-peer -peer debate, uh, <laughs> which is uh, a, a bit. Uh, Different. I think that uh, some of the proposals that are, are being branded about and uh, some of the proposals in Brazil, but also things like academic file sharing and things like that are very narrow, specific things uh, that are more akin to, uh, for example, sharing of, data, of, of, of information. But yeah, you can go for it. Yeah. So I think there's, there's some good points here on, on both sides, and I'm going to have to come back to what it means to be a librarian and a, and a, a, a member of a, a great tribe that's involved in cultural preservation so that people in the future can actually access it. People can write novels, make movies, etc., etc., because they have access to it. And I think that libraries, and then to a, to a similar extent over the last 10 years, the visually impaired, are getting caught up in the discussion about how easy it is to copy zeros and ones. And, and actually, all the time that we are discussing, uh, all the time that we conflate these two sorts of issues, we don't do anything about the big problem that the visually impaired had for such a long time. And as I said in my opening presentation, we run the risk of just letting a significant period of our digital content output just be a kind of black hole. Because I think we will solve this eventually. Um, and we'll, we'll come to some sort of a, a arrangement. But if that arrangement is in like 10 years' time, 15 years, 20 years' time, then there's, we, we call it a digital black hole. Because th there's going to be plenty of stuff now. We already, we already know that like material from the late 90s, early 2000s is in this black hole, and it's not going to get out because of copyright length of term, et cetera, et cetera. And I just, I just can't see why, as a society, we'd really think that's a really good thing. So, Paola, it, it is good to hear, and I think you're correct, that there's not really any fundamental opposition to libraries kind of doing their job. But because what we're talking about here is transfer of digital files, we unfortunately get caught up in, in these sorts of debates. And we, we're going to have to start pleading, getting down on our knees and begging and saying, look, Libraries, we pay license fees where we need to pay license fees. We are strict adherents to copyright. We teach our users about copyright, and I don't think there's too many other professions or intermediaries that do that with the people that come through their doors. Uh, we do media and information literacy in schools, uh, and I know that there's elements of intellectual property in that. So we have to, unfortunately, kind of move ourselves outside of this a little bit, even, even though as a, as a user of... Uh, as a consumer of music and movies, I want to get into this. I find it really fascinating. But I have to keep my sort of library hat on in here and say, don't confuse the two issues because we're going to do ourselves a disservice if we don't find a way to preserve all of this stuff. Agreed. Uh, any questions? Yeah. I would like to add something uh, about file sharing. That in Turkey, file sharing and uh, piracy in general, also serves as a way of uh, circumventing censorship. In a country where hundreds of thousands of books are banned and hundreds of movies are still banned, we use file sharing to circumvent censorship as well. And, and I'm not saying that there aren't legitimate reasons to do certain things in certain countries. That's not what the argument here, similar to the library argument, we're not talking about people using 
um, you know, DNS, you know, um, alternative DNS services to get around different things for political purposes. That, that's a whole different conversation. I mean, we are very much about free speech and we love our content to get into every country. We are blocked ourselves in a lot of countries, but that's, a, that's different including, just like the library issues, there are exceptions, but even your local station here, um, Fox, your Fox station here, there are currently 57 sites that are legally streaming their content virtually at the same time that they're doing it and they're paying the licensing fees. And the other sites are getting advertising revenue and not paying. And that hurts the creation of local stations here. I wish I had the powers to, uh, uh, to do something like I did with my students. Uh, if, if anyone mentions file sharing again, uh, you, I fail you, but uh, I can't. I was mentioning streaming. <laughs> yeah. No, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well played, sir, well played. Uh, okay, any other question not related to file sharing? Sorry. Can I, can I yeah. ask you a question? We, I think there is some interesting things here, and it's great to have you in the room, sir, because I think you can give us a, a different sort of perspective. And I, I want to pick up the extended collective licensing, because actually that is, that is a solution. Um, um, it'll be a solution in regions and in countries, um, and uh, it works quite well in uh, Scandinavia, and, uh, and it's certainly been looked at, and I think questions on it in the EU copyright sort of review, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have libraries working quite happily under extended collective license agreements. It doesn't work for all of them. There's huge opposition in the US, so you're, you're never going to get US librarians or, or people there. They just they say it's incompatible with fair use. We can't do the things if we enter into one of these agreements. We can't do what we can already do under fair use. So. We we can see it as a kind of um, solution that is, that is going to prolong the patchwork. So, so some countries can kind of get ahead, and that's, that's pretty decent. You know, that, that's, that's going to be great for the, the Dutch and the Scandinavians. And I'm kind of all for that in the, in the short term, but it will prolong the patchwork. So I guess where I'd sort of bring in an, a bigger question here, because of course IFLA's asking for an international framework, as I said, not to harmonize, but to provide basic standards. But is there any possibility ever that we will get to a global license? And this is where I'm sort of looking at our colleague from, from Fox uh, over there, <laughs> just as you're checking your phone. But I mean, people now use content globally. If, if, you, if, you, if, if I want to download something tonight from eMusic, I'm expecting to be able to do it from my computer in my room and not get the message, sorry, this is not available in the Netherlands at this time. Uh, which is where my account is based. I mean, that, that to me is just mind-blowingly short-sighted. But, but, uh, but I've, I've spoken to people in the, in the music industry, the, Art, the Recording Industry Association of America, who say, look, um, actually, we're ready to move with this right away, but the territorial nature of collecting societies means that this is practically impossible because you will destroy their business model. Um, and we work quite closely with IFRO and these sorts of organisations, and that to me is that to me is kind of interesting because we're, we're we're then running up against an entrenched industry that basically generates its its money and its profits by dividing the world up into territories at exactly the same time as most of the world's population have stopped bothering about territories on the internet. And I just wondered, from your perspective, whether a global license is ever possible. Here, here's the, the problem with the global license is who is paying for that global license because what happens is you want to create local distributors within the country, within a region. You want to incentivize a cultural, it's a show that's you know, created in Turkey, right? You, you can't sell a global license to anybody for a show that may not have a global audience. And so you run into that problem. You also run into the problem of how movies sometimes are funded, which is you sell the rights to a region and they invest in the movie beforehand. It's like a Kickstarter idea. You, know, you invest us early, you have the exclusivity to distribute that in your territory. That's very important for independent films. Um, that's how they get funded, is they, they will sell each country and each territory before the film is made and get the dollars, then make the movie, and they have that exclusivity, no one knowing if it's going to be good or not or, or being sold. You know, not every movie is successful, we wish, but it's just not the case. Um, so what happens if you're talking about a global license, really the only ones who can do it are the big players. You know, you have a Google. They could probably afford a global license, um, but some co a company in Turkey 
they can't afford a global license, you know, potentially. I don't think they have the reserves, you know, the billions of dollars that a Google or a Facebook has. Um, so what ends up happening is you'll have a very few local distributors in a globally licensed world. Uh, I, I, uh, I see this a bit like... Sorry, you know, no, 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 it's, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, I see global uh, uh, licensing like Netflix. I know it's been talked about before, but I always, you know, you're funding lots of things with the same pot of money, and for each uh, uh, orange is a new black, you get one uh, hemlock grove that nobody watches. Uh, anyone who is familiar with both shows, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you get different funding, and uh, the, uh, you fund both the successes and the utterly abject and horrendous failures. <laughs> anyway, uh, global uh, licensing is it's, it's a nice place to end. Any questions, any more interventions? Uh, uh, we've uh, meandered away from from some of the uh, the topics. Uh, I did have a, a, a question that I had reserved uh, uh, to for the panel, uh, sort of following up on on the uh, museums uh, question, and it's uh, something that I've seen a concern about uh, uh, with regards to uh, the the digitalization of uh, works that are in the public domain, and then memory institutions claiming copyright over that. And I was wondering if, if the panelists had encountered something like this, which is, let's say a museum digitizes a, a, a picture and it, uh, uh, that is in the public domain and then uh, they try to sell something or, or, or include a subscription fee for, some, for something like that. And I, uh, I was uh, thinking if that's something that, uh, that the panelists had encountered at all. Yeah, I'd, I'd say it's bad form, as we might say in the UK. I mean, it does happen. And I think, you know, with, and some of you may be familiar with the Europeana project who've been pushing quite uh, strongly on um, sort of public domain licensing and stuff like this. And yeah, they, they, are try, they try to really push people not to do things like that because that kind of re, that really defeats the purpose of, of sort of the access to knowledge, sharing of culture. So um, no, we're not, we're not into that. A question, where do they claim the copyright on? On the, on the picture made of the uh, work which is on in the public domain? On the digitization, or? yeah. yeah. Oh. yeah because mm. the threat in the United States, it wouldn't fly probably. Because again, I, I, this is something I've repeated before, but uh, the threshold is different in the United States. Probably it would not meet the threshold of originality, but digitization in, in Europe probably could, could meet the requirement. And so... Mm. Uh, the act of putting something and digitizing it, a uh, picture, would, would create a new copyright. That's the idea. Mm. Yeah, I think it's... I don't a, think uh, it should like work that. like that, but yeah. no. 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 Yeah, 70 years point. might be enough. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. But consider it from this perspective, because I, in, I, in another life I also am an historian um, of an aspect of American history. And one of the concerns that historians have is in using materials from libraries where there is only one copy of a work that is now in public domain, or very, very few copies, very, very hard to find. So libraries often do have terms and conditions uh, which are not imposed by copyright because the, the text or illustration is out of copyright. Nonetheless, I bought the car, I washed the car, I maintained the car, I housed the car, I feed the car. So shouldn't I get something when you say, I'll borrow the car? And I, I think that's the thought behind what a number of institutions, what a number of, of uh, university libraries are doing. Yeah, and this is uh, connected to um, sort of digitization of orphan works and things like this. Sometimes the, the, these, these things cost a lot of money. To, to do a mass digitization project for a publicly funded institution, hugely expensive. So often you go into a public-private partnership to do the work, and then off the back of that, you say to your private partner, you can exploit this work for n number of years. 
So whilst we find that you know that's something we have to sort of live with, our concern is making that period of um, commercial exploitation as short or as appropriate as possible. And I think you know um, we haven't got explicit standards and guidelines on this, but um, it's difficult for libraries because if people come to you and say, right, we'll help you digitise this, and then basically we're going to make money off it for 15 years or you're not going to get it digitised at all. And then the library looks and says, well, we can't afford to do it on our own. What, what do we do? Do we stick to our principles or do we digitise the collection? So many, yeah, many libraries have sort of... I, I wouldn't exactly call it sort of dancing with the devil, but, but you know, you want to make sure that that period is quite tight um, and, and appropriate, I think. So, yeah, that sort of thing does happen. I'm not really into the thing where, full stop, the thing suddenly then becomes a protected piece of work. So. But at that point, you're leaving out the actual author. I mean, you, you're doing, you're making a good deal for you. The company that's privatizing it is making a good deal for them and not paying for anything except for the investment into you guys. And who's left out in the cold is the authors who aren't being paid. It depends, because this is what copyright exceptions are for. So, no, for society. So it depends entirely how you. So, sorry? Well, it, it, as I say, at the, at the oh. moment it's so difficult for us to get any digitization projects off the ground because they're so expensive. It's literally like the only, you know, for some people it's the only kind of thing. But Yes? Yeah, I just wanted to indicate that uh, uh, the, the libraries, uh, the documents are used by people who are from outside for uh, their own purpose. Uh, sometimes it's private use, sometimes it's research use. Uh, in some of the copyright uh, materials, they ask you, ask the person to sign and say whatever is going to use it for, to be allowed to use it. Or else uh, the library has to pay for the copyright or whatever. And, uh, but uh, in some countries like uh, in Nigeria, there, uh, as long as the document is not available in the country, you, the, you are uh, allowed to make a copy of three copies of it, in fact, and make it available for research institutions and so on. So I think uh, this aspect is very important because the documents which you are uh, giving to our users are most of the time are not available wherever they are uh, giving it because sometimes they are in the US, sometimes they are in uh, the UK or sometimes they are even in uh, Swaziland where you are in the UK you want to use it. So it's not available in the country. So I think those are some of the exceptions that really we should put emphasis on. Thank you. No. Agreed. Um, I was going to finish with a, a question of, uh, to everyone. Uh, 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 if I gave you a wish, uh, my megalomania uh, powers uh, of, uh, of what would you change, but I think we've overrun. Uh, I don't know. Uh, just one or two words. What would you change of the system? Uh, of, uh, currently, if you wanted to, anything done with the, uh, with the cur current copyright and, and, and uh, in international regime? Anyone? If you had one way so, to change, I don't know. What would WIPO do at Treaty? If I may, I, I won't uh, express any WIPO's wish in this forum, but I can Paolo's, Paolo's wish. I think it's, it's something that has been mentioned over and over again in this uh, IGF, not only in this panel, that um, solutions to these kind of challenges, for instance, um, preserving uh, the, the born digital material in a way that is balanced, uh, requires not only laws, not only licensing, but requires, uh, uh, again, standards, technology on which we need to agree, needs to be interoperable and cannot be left in my, at least at first sight, cannot be completely left to the to private initiatives that uh, are, mm, are not linked together. I don't see, in the, I think this is uh, a key part of the solution and to date I don't see any r truly promising process to find this common solution because uh, there are astonishing technology, content ID, I, I mean, in Europe, I mean, I don't even go, I'm going to go and mention them, they are all great. But still, they won't solve the issue because uh, you have uh, a competitor, some alternatives, and so on. So, my wish, 
it's not a great wish, but at least to, 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 it would be very important, I think, for the international community to, to set a framework that could potentially lead to a truly global and accepted solution, and that would include uh, several players, cannot include only, only governments, but it would need to include governments as well, uh, because they are lawmakers. That's maybe a, a perspective of uh, um, uh, an old, uh, an old uh, in civil, uh, international civil servant, but I think uh, we need to bring all together and try to, to find a common solution. This would be something uh, that at least will let us see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, on that optimistic note, I think it's a, it's a good one note to, to end this. Uh, and I would like uh, everyone to, uh, who is left to show your appreciation for the panelists for a very excellent uh, panel. Thanks very much. Uh.